Good morning. Would you please stand and join me in singing, We've a Story to Tell to the Nations. You may be seated. Good morning, and welcome to Hillcrest Christian Church. We are glad that you have chosen to worship with us today, those of you who are here in our sanctuary and those of you who are with us online. For those of you who are at home, we encourage you to take a moment to secure whatever elements best represent for you the bread and the cup as we will be sharing in Holy Communion later in our service. Will you please pray with me? As we come before you, O God, we come with eager spirits, longing to be filled by you. We ask that you enter into this time of worship in a way that cannot be mistaken. Fill us with peace and newness of life as we lead toward the resurrected spirit so that we can be what you call us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Good morning, church. We're glad that you're with us today and hope that you'll feel God's Spirit moving among us as we worship and praise God and fellowship together. We always like to take a moment and recognize anyone who's with us for the first time, if you're a guest or a visitor. And if you care to introduce yourself, we would love to get to know you better. Any guests this morning? Well, we're glad that all of you are here. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. Our elders will have our, their final session tonight on uh, dementia and Alzheimer's. Leslie Fuller has been doing a great job uh, doing a virtual uh, learning time for us about uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, and we will conclude that tonight. Also, this uh, Wednesday, Bruce Southard is in a handbell choir at uh, Cedar, Village, Cedar Lake Village. They're going to have a concert Wednesday at 3, and he invites any of you who'd like to come and hear some handbell music. To, to do so. Our men's lunch this week, we're going to kind of mix it up a little bit. Instead of meeting tomorrow on Monday, we're going to meet on Wednesday at 1130 at Olive Garden. And a few prayer concerns to share with you, but uh, any other announcements this morning? All right. Uh, Dave, Ar we want to continue to remember Dave Arnold's father. He's having uh, treatment for cancer. Mary Matney's niece's husband uh, will be having surgery tomorrow to rem remove a brain tumor. And Lois Moline, who had triple bypass surgery a week ago, she's home and uh, in little pain, but, but feeling stronger every day. So we want to continue to remember Lois. Any other joys or concerns this morning? Jan? Oh, and that was Terry's cousin, Daryl. Yes, yes. We will keep him in our prayers. Any other? All right, then let us prepare our hearts and our minds for hearing the Word of God. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Our first scripture selection this morning is Psalm 48, verses 1 through 3 and 10 through 14. This is one of the Zion Psalms and was probably used during major festivals and was sung to express the people's faith in Jerusalem and in the God whose temples were there. Please read responsively with me. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Within its citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Consider well its ramparts. Go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generation. Our second scripture selection today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Mark tells of Jesus' return to Nazareth, of the break with his family and acquaintances, and of the sending out of the twelve disciples for ministry. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, Where did this man get all of this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and, and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? Where? And they took offense at him. 
Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing with staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. He said to them, Whenever you go into a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. This ends the reading of God's word. Hello and good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Lauren Hayes. My mom is Debbie, who just read the scripture for you. And my mom and I have been attending Hillcrest since the mid 90s, um, so for a while now. And I went to the University of Missouri in Kansas City and uh, got involved with an organization there called Campus Crusade for Christ, or CREW, and started working with them full time after I graduated from UMKC in 2008. So I've been working with them now for about almost 13 years. Um, For the last eight or so years, I've been serving with Campus Crusade for Christ overseas in Central Asia. So if you haven't seen me around, that is why. Um, And so I returned last summer from overseas and um, was praying about what God might have next for me. And he very clearly has called me to continue working with college student ministry with Campus Crusade for Christ in Philadelphia. So I will be joining that team and will be moving in just a couple of weeks um, to be working with college students. There's about 300,000 college students living in Philadelphia and about 37 college campuses. So I will be working primarily on the campuses of Temple University and Drexel University. And the main calling that God has really put on my life back when I first uh, joined staff with Campus Crusade is from Isaiah 61.1, proclaiming liberty for the captives to join with what Jesus is doing to help women specifically who are being held captive by sin and darkness and to help them walk with Jesus in the light. Um, And so with Campus Crusade, we we seek to create a, a safe environment for students, college students, to explore questions about life and faith and God. And we seek to, to show them who Jesus is, who the Jesus that we know to be truly is, and what, what God's word says about the life that is found in Jesus. And so I would love um, to talk more with you if you'd like to hear more about what I'll be doing in Philadelphia. Um, I'll have some cards out in the foyer after the service where you can fill out if you'd like to receive my monthly prayer emails or set up a time to connect with me. Um, But I've just been so thankful for so many of you who have been at Hillcrest um, praying for me and, and partnering with me in ministry through giving financially since the very beginning in 2008. And I'm just so grateful for all of you. And um, I would love to invite you also to, um, before I move, I will be having a time at a Sapling Grove Park, um, which is at 8210 Grant on Wednesday evening, July 7th from 6 to 9 p.m., just kind of for people to stop by and, and see me and just have some time in person before before I move. I know this last year was hard, um, and I haven't been able to see a lot of you until today um, that I'm here in person with you, and so would love to have a little more time with you if you're available on Wednesday evening, July 7th, but just want to say thank you for your prayers, for your support over the years, and for your continued support as I move into this next season of ministry in Philadelphia. Thank you.
please join me in singing as the deer. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. This is the time in our worship when we pause and go to God in prayer, not only speaking to God, but listening for that voice of the Spirit. Let us now be in an attitude of prayer. Merciful God, you've commissioned us to be healers and proclaimers of the gospel. But often we fail to respond. Oh, it's too much trouble or it costs too much. And besides, we have to do the job with people that sometimes get on our nerves or with people that we don't even like very much. Forgive us, oh God, for taking the precious gift of your community for granted. Forgive us for not seeing your presence among us, for neglecting the privilege of serving you. Oh God, this morning we're mindful of many whose lives are troubled and restless. People who are unhappy in marriage and feel betrayed by life. Children who are the victims of marital strife and divorce and live in a jungle of fear and confusion and self-reproach. Friends who are ill and live under the shadow of pain and hurt and separation. People who have experienced the loss of dear ones and now feel that all life has lost its meaning and purpose. People who have lost jobs or homes or self-respect or reputation or sense of direction. Oh God, this morning we lift prayers for all those affected by the building collapse in Sunrise, Florida. We ask that we remember those who wait for news of their loved ones, and we pray for strength and comfort for them. We thank you for the many workers who are involved in the search and rescue effort, and we pray for strength for them as well. We lift up our youth and adults who are participating in the mission trip in Loveland, Colorado this week, and we pray that their experience will be faithful, fruitful, and fulfilling. We thank you also for your servant, Lauren Hayes, and ask that you grant her strength of spirit and body in her service, and that her ministry will touch many for the sake of Christ. O oh God, take this day's life into your own keeping. Guide all our thoughts and feelings, direct our energies, instruct our minds, sustain our wills. Take our hands and make them skillful to serve you. Take our feet and make them swift to do your bidding. Take our eyes and keep them fixed upon your everlasting beauty. 
take our mouths and make them eloquent in testimony to your love. May this day be a day of obedience, a day of spiritual joy and peace. O oh God, we lift these prayers to you in the name of the one who bids us follow me, Jesus the Christ, who gave us these words to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. woman driven by love for her Lord recklessly poured out a valuable essence disregarding the score and one it was broken and spilled out a fragrance filled all the room like a prisoner released from his shackles like a spirit set free from the tomb Just for love of you, Jesus, my most precious treasure, lavished on thee. Thank you. 
like to invite any children that we have to come forward for the children's moment. Good morning. Putting quarters in bacon, right? That's we buy animals through, uh, through the Heifer Project to help those in need. What have I got here, Sydney? Suitcase. When when would you need a suitcase? When you go on a trip. Okay. What kind of things might you pack in a suitcase if you were going on a trip? Clothes. What else? Some snacks and toothbrush. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Maybe a swimsuit if you're going to the beach or something. Yeah. Okay. You know, when Jesus was traveling around, he didn't have a suitcase. And his friends, when he told them to go out and do some things, he said, don't take a suitcase. You know what he said to take? A walking stick and a good pair of sandals, just like you've got on. He said, you didn't need to take a lot of stuff. Why do you think he said that? Why, what, don't you think that the, his friends would want to take stuff with them? Yeah, they would. I wonder if they went home and said, yeah, I've got to pack a suitcase. But Jesus said no. And I think when they went out and talked to people, I think people let them into their homes and fed them and that sort of thing so they didn't have to take snacks. Um, so I think people, people helped them when they went out. Now, you know, when we go on a vacation or a trip, we do need to pack a suitcase, right? But to tell people about Jesus, do we need a suitcase? No. To tell someone we love them, do we need a suitcase? No. To maybe to do something nice for someone, do we need a suitcase? No, of course not. We can do all kinds of things and we can just leave the suitcase at home, right? We can follow Jesus with just what we have. And you've got a perfect pair of sandals to do that. Can you, can you find your prayer hands and repeat after me? Dear God, help us remember that you are with us and that's all we need to love you and others. Amen. Thank you. After traveling all around Galilee, Jesus decides to make a trip back to his hometown of Nazareth. And you would think that his own people would have welcomed him with open arms and been most receptive to his message. But they didn't and they weren't. They just couldn't believe that God's Messiah could come in somebody so ordinary, so common. Isn't this the carpenter, they asked? They knew, they knew Jesus' whole family. They were nice people, but still there wasn't anything really special about them. They weren't even outstanding leaders in the community. They never had their house featured in the Nazareth Parade of Homes. There was nothing spectacular about Jesus' family or, his, or, or Jesus. But when the Messiah comes, he's going to be uh, come in spectacular means. There's going to be flaming chariots and music and, and clouds and fireworks. So the Messiah isn't going to be somebody so ordinary from Nazareth, a hometown carpenter who quietly slips into town to see his family. Jesus, the hometown boy who had amazed the crowds and attracted strangers, is rejected by the people who knew him best and loved him the most. And you might think that the rejection, after the rejection, Jesus would have had enough. After all, if your hometown church doesn't back you, what's the point? But Jesus doesn't quit. In fact, he is driven even harder for the sake of God's mission. So to get things going, Jesus decides to send the disciples out to, 
to do some preaching and healing. Now, the fact that Jesus chooses this particular moment to usher his disciples into their first mission is somewhat surprising. I mean, they, they've, they've evidenced no great insight into Jesus and his message. They're still stumbling about two steps behind each punchline in his parables, about three steps behind in recognizing the meaning of his miracles. But despite their imperfect comprehensions, Jesus sends them out, trusting them to, to spread his word. But before they go, he gives them a pep talk. He's like a coach who's meeting with them in the locker room prior to the big game. He warns them that it's not going to be a cakewalk. As badly as the world needs to hear about God's coming kingdom, it may not want to hear about it. So Jesus tells his disciples that there will be some rejection, but that they must not let that response pull them down. You know, rejection can be like quicksand. You can sink in it and it can swallow you whole. Sometimes you have to shake the dust off your feet and move on. They couldn't afford to be weighed down by rejection or anything else, including their possessions. In fact, Jesus spends more time stripping the disciples of presumed traveling necessities than he does outfitting them for their expedition. His instructions seem kind of foolish to us. Take no bread, no bag, no money, not even an extra tunic for warmth, or sturdy shoes just in case. The only equipment that he tells them to take is a staff, an item to facilitate movement and not slow them down. He doesn't sit down with the twelve and sit down there with a, with a map or a snake bite kit or a pack of provisions or a feasibility study or a set of goals and objectives. He gives the disciples only what they need most, a mission and the authority to carry out that mission. Now, my question for us this morning is, is that still good advice for we, for us Christians who travel our faith journeys? What does it mean to, for us to take no baggage and to have dust-free sandals? Well, it suggests a couple of things to me. First, that when we <clears throat> are sharing the message with others, we have to leave at home our theological or emotional baggage. Our prejudices, our prejudgments about the people with whom we will come in contact we should not bother packing our set ideas about how church ought to be in the future based on what church has been in the past or even in the present. We also must resist packing judgments about ourselves, that we're not qualified to tell others about our faith, that somehow we're not good enough or that we don't know enough to be a witness for the gospel. The other thing that I think that this advice about traveling light says to me is for us not to get hung up on possessions or things, because the things to which we hold so tightly are often the very things that get in the way of our relationship with God. In addition, when we're dealing with persons for whom faith or church is not part of their world, and Lauren, I suspect you'll be dealing with a lot of that in, in Philadelphia. We don't want to get, give them the, the impression that they have to have things in order to claim the gospel as their own or participate in a faith community. Now, speaking of things, can you imagine Jesus ordering 12 pairs of sandals from the local sandal maker? And I can just hear the I can hear them when they, Jesus hands out the, the, uh, the sandals to each one. Peter says, Master, I want the kind of sandals that light up when I walk. They're awesome. Philip confesses, I'd rather wear flip-flops. Thomas asks, how come mine don't have the swoosh on them? John wonders, Jesus, did you get the ones with extra arch support? James shoves his pairs back in the box, tosses them back to Jesus, and says, only nerds wear plain, plain sandals. I want Birkenstocks. Jesus hands them back and says, this isn't about looks or being cool or image. Wear these. Forget about what's on your feet. That's not important. What is important is our message. Wear these sandals and be ready to shake off the dust. 
Now, the gesture of shaking off the dust was uh, by the Jews. When they went to Gentile areas and they came back home, they wanted to shake off the dust of impurity. If instead of an open door, the disciples get the doors slammed in their face, he counsels a judicious use of their time and energy. He advises his missionaries to conjole and, and convince reluctant listeners, but to shake the dust of a rejecting household off their feet as they leave. If people don't listen, well, you tried. Don't let it get to you. Put them behind you and move on. Shake the dust off and keep moving. That advice is a little tough for me to swallow. After all, most of us want to be liked. I mean, if, and if we can't be liked, we at least want to be listened to. We want our message to be heard. When we draw our breath in pain to share that which is most personal and valuable to us, our faith, when we go out of our way to perform an act of Christian kindness, when we make ourselves vulnerable, when we risk by sharing ourselves, when we do all that and we are met with a cold shoulder or deaf ears or a hardened heart or harsh words, well, how do you respond? We may feel hurt or angry or betrayed, but if it's someone we really, really care about and want to reach, we may be reluctant to shake off the dust. And instead, we might look at our feet and see what we tracked in or what we just stepped into. Most of us don't like to give up on someone. After all, God's love doesn't give up on us, and so shouldn't our love be the same. Isn't that why no one likes to clean up the church rolls, weeding out those who have had no contact with the church in 20 or 30 years? Let's don't give up on the Smiths. They may be back someday. How does that jive with the advice of Jesus? And what if someone decides to leave the church? That can be difficult, even for pastors. Sometimes the reasons given by folk for leaving a congregation are weighty and theological and consequential. But sometimes that's not the case. Listen to recent responses from some, from some clergy as to why some folk left their congregations. One pastor said, we cut the pews to allow for accessibility and one member left. Two came the next week and brought chairs and sat facing backward the whole service. My home church switched from real wax candles to refillable oil tubes. A member couldn't possibly fathom worshiping without real wax candles. Pastor preaching while pregnant. True story, a couple left our church because a noticeably pregnant woman should not be in the pulpit. People left and wouldn't talk to anyone because someone asked them not to let their kids use crayons to color on the pews. The purple banners for Lent clashed with the roses that the lady had donated for Sunday, and she wanted the banners changed. My church had blue carpet for decades, but when it needed to be replaced, it was changed to burgundy. We lost at least two families over it. One pastor said a family left during the pandemic because I mentioned George Floyd's murder and the Black Lives Movement. And finally, this from a female pastor who said, we had a family leave because I didn't wear pantyhose. Now, if me wearing pantyhose will keep you in the church, <laughs> there's the door. Because I. <laughs> sometimes the reasons for leaving a church are petty and inconsequential. But sometimes people leave a congregation over theological or doctrinal differences. It's happened in our congregation, and it's never easy to accept. I think it's, it's painful for everyone. And I try not to take it personally because I know that people need to connect with faith communities that reflect to some degree their theological perspectives. And if it's not this congregation, I, I wish them well and pray that they'll find a new church home. So as a congregation and as individuals leaving the church, we can both shake the dust off and move on. Jesus says, keep moving. Do what you can, and then don't worry about it. Let it go. Now, I know that many of you in Christian love have extended 
your hands to others outside the church, and maybe with inside, inside the church, only to have those hands slapped or ignored? Are you able to say, well, I, I did my best, I tried, and then move on? Or, or do you spend time agonizing and obsessing about the rejection? It's a tough assignment. Most of us don't want rejection to have the final word. I'm certain Jesus didn't want rejection to have the last word either. But his message is so important, so critical. The kingdom of God is at hand. And there simply is not time to squander by remaining where you're not being heard. Our grandma Engel used to say, don't go places you're not invited. Jesus says, don't stay in places where you're not welcome. The disciples are given a task but no quota or goal. They are to proclaim the message with all their being, and including their outward behavior. But the responsibility for the outcome has to be left to God. Jesus says, don't, don't sweat it if someone refuses to listen. Leave them, but before you leave, before you shake the dust off, let them know how critical their rejection really is. I think to appreciate the words, shake off the dust, is to realize that some persons are not yet ready to listen to us, no matter how, much, how sincere we are or how hard we try. Shake off the dust reminds me that I won't be able to be a pastor to every person that I try to be for whatever reason. I will not be able to meet the needs of the spiritual needs of every person. You will not be able to reach every person to whom you extend a Christian hand, nor will this congregation. Jesus says that's okay because you may be able to reach someone who thinks I'm out to lunch. I may be able to speak a word, perhaps the same word that you've been trying to say, to someone who has yet to respond. That's why we need each other. And another congregation may be a place where someone can grow spiritually. You see, Jesus told his disciples that they could take only what they absolutely needed and not one thing more. No bread, no money, no American Express card, no cell phone, none of that stuff. Only what they absolutely needed. One staff, one pair of sandals, one tunic, and one companion. Jesus sent them out in pairs. He could have sent them out alone, and maybe they could have covered twice the territory, but he didn't. He paired them up because he knew that to do the job before them, they needed each other. Sure, they, they could get along without their iPhones, an extra tunic, or even a church brochure, but they couldn't leave home without each other. They needed each other, and so do we. Lots of things in our life of faith we can do alone. Pray, read scripture, contemplate the creation. But we cannot work for the mission of Christ alone. We need others to help. Help in spreading the good news. Help in bringing healing to this broken world. Now there's going to be times, just like the disciples I'm sure had, that we won't see eye to eye. We may, we may irritate each other, but that doesn't matter. To do God's work, we still need each other. To bear each other's burdens to keep each other encouraged and faithful, to believe for one another when faith comes hard, to hold firm to one another when the storms come. The job is still big if we take it seriously. The world remains in need of healing and in need of the promise and grace of God. You may remember that song that was popular several years ago, People Need the Lord. I think that's still true, maybe now more than ever. Joyce Rupp, one of my favorite authors, as you know, reflects on Jesus' words to his disciples and writes, And Jesus, you said, take nothing for the journey. What did you mean, trust or more than trust? Did you, prefer, did you perhaps imply that we can't wait until we have all the possible things we need? That we can't postpone doing until we are positive of our talents? That we can't hold off our commitment until we are absolutely sure that we won't make a mistake? I think of all the excuses and reasons we can give for not serving and giving. No time, no talent, no knowledge, no energy, no assured results. You say, take nothing. 
Don't worry about your inadequacies. I will provide for you. Go, just go, go with my power. Risk the road. Risk the work. Go, I will be with you. What else do you need? The late Henry Nouwen said, when Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, he summarized in these gestures his own life. Jesus is chosen from all eternity, blessed at his baptism in the River Jordan, broken on the cross, and given as bread to the world. Being chosen, blessed, broken, and given is the sacred journey of the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. He says, when we take bread, bless it, break it, and give it with the words, this is the body of Christ. We express our commitment to make our lives conform to the life of Christ. We too want to live as people chosen, blessed, and broken, and thus become food for the world. All are welcome at Christ's table, regardless of church affiliation or denomination. Come and eat of the bread of life and drink from the cup of blessing. Please join me in singing our communion hymn. His friends on earth united to share the bread and wine. The bread of life is broken, the wine is freely poured. For us in solemn token of Christ our dying Lord, we eat and drink receiving from Christ the grace we need and in our hearts believing on him by faith we feed with wonder and thanksgiving for love that knows no end we find Jesus living, our ever-present friend. One bread is ours for sharing, one single fruitful vine. Our fellowship declaring, renewed in bread and wine. Renewed, sustained, and given by token, sign, and word. The pledge and seal of heaven, the love of Christ our Lord. Lord Jesus. I remember and celebrate your faithfulness to me and to all who receive you. I can't begin to fathom the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion, yet you took that pain for me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your extravagant love and unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gave me life, abundant life now and eternal life forever. Each time we take communion, Lord, let us recommit our lives, our hearts, our thoughts, our everything to you. Fill us today with your peaceful spirit. As we move through the next week, help us hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to our hearts. Help us to share its message faithfully as you give the opportunity. When Jesus was with his friends in the upper room on the last night of his life, he took some bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, for this bread is my body. It's broken for you. It's given for you. Take and eat and remember me. And then the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new agreement, the new covenant in my blood. 
take and drink all of you in remembrance of me. The gifts of God for the family of God. Pastor Rick Warren writes, I can say God is first place in my life, but there are two things that you can look at to tell which is really in first place. If you look at my schedule and if you look at my bank account activity, that tells what is first place no matter what I say is first. The way I use my money and the way I use my time tells what's first place in my life. That's one of the reasons why we receive an offering during worship in addition to helping accomplish God's goals of ministry, this action restates who ranks first place in our lives. Let us now honor God with the receiving of God's tithes and our offerings. Please bless these gifts and the givers and all the people that we seek to serve. In Jesus' name, amen. We conclude our service this morning with singing of our hymn of invitation. Hymn of invitation, I have decided to follow Jesus. We issue that invitation each Sunday to anyone who feels called by God's Spirit to unite in fellowship with our congregation through transfer of membership or through first-time confession of Jesus as Savior and Lord. If God has touched your heart in that way, Please come forward as we sing together. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me, still will fall. Follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No 
turning back, no turning back. Will you decide now? No, Jesus. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now? No, Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Let us go now to be healers in a broken world. Let us go to be proclaimers of the gospel. Let us go because we have everything we need. We have God's promise. We have God's power. And we have each other. Let us go now as children of God. Amen. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you this day. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you always. Celebrate and share the joy. Celebrate new life. Go in peace and the peace of God be with you always.